Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome back. Um, any problems, questions, or difficulties? For, yeah. I, I guess, did, did you have any thoughts on the um, on the second set of problems? Or No, I haven't. I'm sorry. I haven't, uh, I haven't looked at them yet. Oh, OK, OK. I'm still worried about the third set of problems. <laughs> so are we. <laughs> I'm more worried about getting the questions out on the third set than I am about getting the grades in on the second set. <laughs> But I know that the second set was a lot harder than the first set. Yeah, yeah. Anyhow, I mean, you know, the problems are really just for you guys to practice. And... Other questions? OK. Um, and I got some feedback um, from one of my students from four years ago said, the problems from Villani's book are very hard. Which I haven't I haven't been giving problems from Villani's book, but I guess I did maybe four years ago. I don't know. Uh, some I did. I did give some hard problems four years ago, but I'm not planning to this this year. Uh, okay, so I think let's see. Uh, I mean, we were sort of I'd stated the Bishop Gromov theorem, and I was about to embark on the proof. But uh, before I do that, let me make some uh, some remarks, uh, various remarks that I think are in order. Um, so if we go back, I mean, somehow lurking in the background, I've been trying to teach this course is the, on the assumption that you don't, guys don't know any Ramanian necessarily know differential geometry, at least not all of you. Um, but somehow lurking in the background is the Riemann tensor um, of this, you know, in the smooth world of this course. Of course, this, the course is about the non-smooth geometric world. But um, so let me just re let me re recall some things about normalization. So, and there's different ways to say this, but recall if I'm on a manifold. And um, and if I have two curves, xs and yt, and they don't really, they could be parameterized on minus epsilon epsilon, but let me just parameterize them on one for simplicity. If those are arc length parameterized geodesics, let me, maybe I should put the epsilon. arc length parameterized geodesics. So uh, maybe this could be XS and this could be YT passing through a common point. X zero equals Y zero. Then uh, I claimed earlier on, uh, probably without proving it, um, Actually, I don't need the two, never mind about the two. Um, that this is basically uh, the leading order term here is going to be x dot zero s minus y dot zero t. And that's a tangent vector at x zero equals y zero squared. And then the next order correction to this is going to be some gadget that looks like s squared t squared, um, probably over six. It's four to six, four choose two um, times uh, some multilinear object are x zero dot y zero dot um, x zero dot y zero dot um, where plus low order terms. And um, yeah, I mean, you might worry. Yeah, okay. So this multilinear job. So where um, if I write that multilinear job in, uh, it's sort of clear from Taylor's theorem that this, at least if the distance is smooth near the origin, which it is on Riemannian manifolds, it's clear that this has to be a multilinear object. It might, you might think it could depend on x double dot or y double dot, but we use the geodesic equation to rewrite those in terms of pair uh, products of x dot and y dot. At zero. And so where this multilinear gadget uh, So usually in coordinates, it would have four indices hanging off it, and there would be an understood summation on the four indices. And then you'd have the 
x tangent vector and the y tangent vector at zero and the x tangent vector and the y tangent vector. And so it, uh, because, because the i and the k are playing symmetric roles and the j and the l are playing symmetric roles without loss of generality, we can take r i j k l to be um, r k i k j i l. And we could also interchange j and l. So this would be like r k l uh, i j. And on the other hand, um, on the other hand, when x dot, when these two curves are parallel, so if if x dot happens to equal y dot and their arc lengths parameterized, then there's only two possibilities: either the curves coincide, or one is the opposite parameterization to the other one. So. Um, In other words, xs equals ys. This is another fact of, fact about Ramanian geometry. So, um, but actually, we want this fact more generally. So, um, so here's a bit of notation um, definition: a metric space is non-branching. Unless um, there exist geodesic segments, let's say uh, D geodesics. So a metric space MD is non branching unless there exist D geodesics, um, XS. And yt such that um, let's say xs equals ys for all s um, in zero one half, but um, there exists a t somewhere between zero and uh, one half and one. such that xt is not yt. Right, so an example of a metric space that's branching would be you take uh, you take three, like this, this picture in the plane, and then uh, the geodesic joining this point to this point goes like so, and the geodesic joining the same point to a point down here goes like so. And um, of course, you know, to make it match up with this definition, I would want to take uh, I would want to take a point over here and over here such that this is the same length as that and this is the same length as that. And once I do that, these two geodesics they agree for a while and then they disagree later. So that's a branch geodesic. And um, we'll mostly be interested in metric spaces that don't have any branch geodesics. So, uh, so a remark or a lemma or whatever is that um, Ramanian manifolds without boundary, so boundaryless Ramanian manifolds have no branch geodesics or non-branching. If you have Ramanian manifolds with boundary, um, um, Ramanian manifolds with boundary can certainly be branching. Can someone give an example of a branching Ramanian manifold with boundary?
So even can you imagine a domain in the plane that would where you'd have geodesics that branch? So geodesics that stayed together for a while and then split up. By the way, remark A is basically sort of an ODE theorem that sort of says in a Ramanian manifold, if you know the geodesic and its tangent, you can find the geodesic from its tangent uh, by solving an ODE. And so if the initial conditions are the same for two geodesics, then the geodesics will be the same. And so that says like either they're always the same or they're, they're not the same except instantaneously. But how could that go wrong when you have a boundary or when you have a plane or domain? Okay, so suppose I take the complement of the unit disk in the plane as my manifold, and it's I'm I'm closing it, right? Or I take the complement of the open unit disk. So how am I going to why, why am I going to end up with branch geodesics in this setting? If you take points on opposite sides. Yeah, then a geodesic has to go either up the top or bot or something. Well, that's true, but um, it, so for example, if I take two points like this, the geodesic joining them, it goes for a while and then it runs along the boundary of the disk and then it comes out like that. And then if I take some other geodesic, like say the geodesic joining maybe this point and this point, it's going to go for a while and hit the boundary. It's going to follow the boundary for a while, and then it's going to come off. And so if you look around one of these points where the, the two geodesics are together for a while, but then they split off at different instances, like maybe the, the green one follows the boundary a little longer and the black one splits off sooner. And so now if you take through, so wherever that junction point is, if you take three points that are equidistant from that junction, and you look at the geodesic joining AB and the geodesic joining AC, you get exactly this picture up here where they're together for half, half their length and separate for half their length. Does that make sense? Um, okay, great. So that's, that's the story about non-branching geodesics. Um, let me come back to the Riemann tensor that, so I was sort of starting to say, oh yes, you have the Riemann tensor, but um, if, um, if X dot is Y dot and I'm a non-branching space, then X S is gonna be Y S for all S. And so when I plug that into this formula, the distance is identically zero. So, you know, the first order term vanishes, but this term has to vanish as well. And that really tells me that, um, that R I I I I has to be zero, no matter what direction the geodesic. So I can pick any I because the, the geodesic can be going through this point here in any, any direction I want. I could have started with any geodesic. Um, so, um, so this sort of, so, you know, one way to get, so one way to get from, You know, if I interchange both of these vectors with both of these vectors, then this shouldn't change. And that's the symmetry that says, if I have ij here and I move it over there and kl here and I move it over, then, then things don't change. On the other hand, if I move, if I move just one, if I interchange just x with y, something probably does change. And, and basically because of this property here that the ris all have to vanish, um, if I just interchange i with j, then I'm going to get a minus sign. And you can basically deduce the rest of the symmetries of the um, of the tensor R from I think what I've written down. 
Um, so what? So when I said the the Ricci tensor is supposed to be a trace of this object. Um, oh, and let me let me give an example before I go on. So if if my Ramanian manifold is the boundary of the Euclidean unit sphere. Um, then I think that the R, I, J, K, L, in order to have these symmetries, um, is basically going to be something like G, I, K, G, J, L, minus uh, G, J, K, G, I, L, up to constant. And if I put a parameter in, so if I made this the sphere of radius lambda instead of the sphere of radius one, I think there would probably be a one over lambda squared here. And um, so, what's, so what's the Ricci tensor? The Ricci tensor, so basically the, the Riemann tensor measures in triangles, the deviation from the Pythagoras rule. So I pick a point X, S, Y, T, and I look at the minimum, the length of the minimum geodesic joining these two points. I ask how far away is it from what it would have been in the Euclidean case. And the first order correction is given by this Riemann tensor, this four, a tensor with four indices, multilinear and all guys, and these various symmetries. And um, what is the Ricci tensor? Well, basically it's like you look at all the triangles through a given geodesic, so you fix the curve XS, if you like, in X dot zero, and you look at all the triangles over all the orthogonal directions. So here's one, and here's another, and if we were in four-dimensional states, there'd be another, and you basically want to average them. And what it's telling you is, if you look at a small cone of geodesics around this one, and you exponentiate it, how does the area of that compare with the area of that, or how does the volume of this compare with the volume of this when I extrapolate it. So Ricci measures area or volume distortion in a given direction. i.e. along one geodesic. And so again, if I was in an n-dimensional manifold, I'd fix one dimension and I would average over these n minus one orthogonal directions. And um, algebraically that corresponds to the Ricci tensor with subscripts IK, for example, is given by taking a trace on the JL indices of this guy. So contracting it with G, uh, JL where uh, you know G upper is the inverse. So G, J, L, G, L, M is delta J, M. So this is the inverse matrix, the metric tensor, R, I, J, K, L. And in my example, if I come back to my example Riemann tensor, the one on the sphere of radius lambda, um, so this is like the N sphere. So the reach tensor of the n-sphere, uh, you would get by, it would be GJL over lambda squared, I hope, um, GIK, GJL minus GJK, GIL. And so it's one over lambda squared, GIK, and when I have the GJL, GJL, uh, this is basically like the trace of the identity matrix. So that's the dimension N. And over here, I would have the GJK. Uh, by this I, relation here, when I multiply this times that, I get um, delta JI. And so this will give me another, oops, this is, should have been GIK. This will give me another copy of the metric tensor, but just one of them. So in the end, I end up with one, one N minus one over lambda squared um, GJK. 
gosh, oh wait, wait, things are messed up. Uh -huh. IK, uh, IK, yeah, 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 GIK, GIK. And so uh, why did I do this? I wanted to point out that um, the Ricci tensor on the n-dimensional sphere is proportional to the metric tensor on the n-dimensional sphere, but the proportionality constant is dimension minus one over lambda squared. Or if we make the convention that the curvature, the sectional curvature of the sphere is one over, uh, wait a second. Uh, I think the lambda is not in the right place. Oh yes. Um, if we make the convention that the the curvature k is one over lambda squared, then this is basically like um, k n minus one gij gik. But something is something's a little bit messing me up. Um, it may be that I didn't have the lambda squared in the right place to begin with. So probably the lambda squared should have been in the numerator to begin with. Um, I'm not sure about the powers of lambda. Maybe I should have stuck with the, the sphere of radius one. And, and uh, so this is, of course, a capital K, not an index. So there's an index K and there's a capital K. But the, the, so my, the point of, my, of this sort of discussion is that uh, although the sectional curvature of the unit sphere in ending dimension is one, the Ricci curvature is not one, it's N minus one. So kappa equals one, if and only if lambda equals one. And then the... Uh, so the natural parameter that enters into this game is somehow the ratio of the curvature to dimension minus one. And if we computed the volume, so here we are, we're, we have this, the Euclidean unit sphere, uh, Round zero. If we complete computed the n dimensional volume of that guy, uh, well, that's one object of interest. And another object of interest is look at the polar cap of angle theta and what's the surface area of that polar cap. And also, what's the surface area, Hn minus one, of the boundary of the polar cap? And basically, um, so I believe that uh, there's, a, there's a constant that I'll probably get wrong. There's a constant, let me call it omega n um, here. And then I think what we have is something like theta to the n. That's what we would have in Euclidean space, uh, but maybe not. So maybe it's something more like um, sine of theta root k over n minus one, probably divided by root k over n minus one to the power n minus one. I think I have this right. And then if you integrated this up to get the volume, you would have omega n integral from zero up to, let's say theta of the same expression sine t root k n minus one over probably k n minus one to the n minus one and you'd integrate it with respect to t. Um, 
And the, the true Bishop Gromov theorem says something like that. Oh yes, wait, let me come back before I left my discussion about the Ricci tensor. So I, I managed to get this far with the, the Ricci tensor. And then finally, um, Finally, we can also take the trace of, on the Ricci tensor, which is like averaging this area distortion over all different directions. And that gives you what's sometimes called the scalar tensor, which is also usually denoted R or sometimes S. So the, scalar curvature. So somehow I was saying that the Ricci curvature measures in a particular direction or along a particular geodesic, the surface area distortion or the volume distortion of cones of geodesics. The scalar curvature measures balls, the volume distortion of the surface area distortion of balls. And you basically get it by averaging the Riemann tensor. So the scalar curvature is sometimes called R, sometimes called S, is basically like GIK, Ricci IK. And um, so if I multiplied by uh, this thing by GIK, I'd get another factor of N. So the, the Ricci curvature for the scalar curvature rather for the N sphere would be something like N times N minus one. And then the bigger the curvature, the curvature kappa is the bigger the Ricci curvature. Or when, when lambda goes to infinity, so kappa goes to zero, this, this thing goes to zero. So, and what that's telling me is that the distortion of the, when lambda goes to infinity, the distortion of a ball like this from, uh, as compared to a Euclidean ball or a tangent space ball of the same radius theta tends to, the distortion tends to zero. The areas, the volumes tend to the same thing. So the true Bishop Gromov would say that um, in a, CDKN space, um, letting MDM, letting VR be the volume of the ball around some X naught of radius R and A of R be uh, whatever the limit is, delta goes down to zero of VR plus delta minus VR over delta, and maybe lim soup. Um, it would say that if you look at so, then there's some limit. And I guess the true limit is probably uh, pi root k over n minus one. The map on this interval of r is to a of r divided by uh, this expression here. So, um, except now I don't know what, I'm just in a CD CAN space, so I don't know what dimension of sphere to compare it to. So, but uh, omega n is an analytic function of n and everything else is analytic in n. So let's divide by capital N. Um, and the same map and then put, put this expression over here. And notice, so it, it claims that this is non-decreasing, non-increasing rather. This is the true bishop Gromov theorem. And uh, by the way, the constants, this is only statement about the dependence on, sorry, this should have been R. I changed variables from theta to R. Um, 
the uh, the constants don't matter to this non-decreasing statement. So I can I can just write integral zero up to r, and I can forget about the constants. Sine of r square root k over n minus one. Um, I can forget about the constants outside. I can't forget about the constants inside the sign. Uh, I better call this some other variable. Same conclusion. So that's the true bishop gromov theorem. And the bishop gromov theorem that I stated, uh, and so, and basically it says that in the IE, IE, and the non-increasing non function becomes constant if m dm is actually the sphere of the appropriate radius. So that the n sphere, uh, with the round metric and its its usual volume and volume, Hausdorff n-dimensional volume. And if you like, it's it's even the it's the n sphere uh, of the appropriate k. Um, so it's like one over square root of k times the ball of radius one. In n dimension, n plus one dimensions around the origin. And so the the version of the theorem that I stated the other day, it still it had some quantity was non increasing, but it was a slightly different quantity than this, slightly not quite as sharp. And so um, so I didn't get the case that I didn't get the expression that I wrote would not be constant for these model spaces. It would still be slightly non increasing because I had the wrong denominators. And that's basically because I used I used this entropic definition of CDKN, and it turns out that the entropic, which is more convenient for proving this non-sharp version of the Brin-Minkowski, rather than the original definition, it turns out that these definitions are equivalent if the space is also non-branching. So if I was willing to assume entropic curvature dimension conditions and non-branching, then I would actually be able to prove the Sharper theorem with the correct denominators. But it's a, to show this equivalence is actually a lot of work. And it's, that was an open problem for quite some time. Um, so anyhow, we'll, be, we'll content ourselves with the non-sharp version of the bishop gromov inequality that has a similar flavor. Other questions? What is the notation for the distance? Um, Which so distance? S, oh, so it's like SN comma, and it looks like. Um, so oh, you I said, said round. Oh, round, round. Oh, okay. Awesome. Thank you. Right. I was so, so SN is a topological object, and when you say round, it becomes a geometric object. Okay, um, great. And so, so it, okay, so what was so what was the theorem that we actually stated? The theorem was um, if M D M is C D K N entropic, um, then uh, I had not quite such a sharp interval. I had a slightly larger interval. But because I, my denominator was capital N instead of capital N minus one. Um, and again, my argument of my sign, um, it should have been K over N minus one, but it was K over N. And my exponent of my sign was n instead of n minus one, but there was an extra r to compensate. So it's the right number of powers of r, at least. Oh, sorry, not vr isn't there. vr over integral zero to r sine n r k minus n. And then, sorry, T, DT. DT, and then there's this extra factor T corresponding to this R up here. 
are not decreasing. So this is the non-sharp Bishop Kromov. And, uh, but it's, it's, although it's non-sharp, it'll still give us plenty of information about these spaces that'll be useful for us. So I wanted to prove it. And so basically uh, recall if we, so let's say, let's call this A and B. So it's non decreasing or like increasing? Non increasing. Thank you. They go down. Um, so basically, we showed last class. Um, so the proof, recall um, A implies B from last class. Taking uh, F to be F to be AR and so that uh, capital F is VR. So actually taking capital F to be VR and little g R to be sine and R root K over N in the lemma. We in the we had a lemma from Volani that I proved at the end of last class. So I basically need to prove part A. And to prove part A, I'm gonna use the Brun-Minkowski theorem in a clever way. Um, so I'm gonna fix X naught. And I, I, um, I need X naught to be in the support of M. And recall, we showed um, that the mass of X naught is zero last class, unless, unless the whole measure is a delta mass sitting in X naught, in which case we're trivial. And I'm going to my two. I'm going to apply Brun-Minkowski theorem. And so, what two sets am I going to apply it to? I'm going to look at, at a vanishingly small ball of radius epsilon around x naught. So, uh, so take delta and epsilon to be small, and then take the first set to be a ball of radius epsilon around x naught. And the second set is going to be an annulus of thickness delta so this is going to be like r and this is going to be r times 1 plus delta sorry it's going to be uh, it's what do you call it um, a thickness R delta. Um, so A1 is going to be, uh, and it doesn't really matter. I think we can take them to be closed. That's fine. Um, is going to be a ball of radius R times one plus delta around X naught closure minus a ball of radius r around x not open so the so a a1 is closed as well um so i'm also fixing a large r and i'm going to apply brun minkowski Um, to estimate the measure of okay. 
where a t is the set of t midpoints between a naught and a one. And so I need to under, so um, so I should have I guess said given R. I'm going to T is going to be the ratio between the small R and the capital R. And so if you think about this situation a little bit, whenever I take XY in A0 cross A1, um, the triangle inequality tells me that the distance between XY is at most r times one plus delta plus epsilon, and it's at least r minus epsilon. Right, the closest two points can be is that they're on the same geodesic, then it's r minus epsilon. The furthest they can be is like the larger radius plus epsilon. And so then my claim is that I should maybe draw a t. So a t is some interpolation between this ball and this annulus, and I don't know exactly what it looks like. It's something sitting out here. But every point in a t divides a geodesic that starts in a naught and ends in a1 in ratio uh, t1 minus t. And so I claim that. Uh, a t is contained in something. What's the something? Um, it's, it should be contained in some other annulus. And the rate, the radius of the enclosing ball is something like r times one plus delta plus an error term. And the, uh, the inside radius of the annulus is something like dr minus an error term. Uh, the plus and minus are not significant here, and they're both centered at x naught. Right, so the idea is that, the, uh, you know, if you think of Euclidean space, so then this radius would be exactly, um, uh, you know, a fraction T of capital R, maybe minus this epsilon distortion, but that goes into the error term. And this radius would be a fraction uh, T of capital R times one plus delta, again, minus some little epsilon thing. where the error terms go to zero as epsilon goes to zero. And again, this is just the triangle inequality again. So the triangle inequality implied these bounds and it also implies these bounds. That basically, when you start with an R that's with an epsilon of X naught, an X that's with an epsilon of X naught, and a Y that's between distance capital R and capital R plus capital R delta of X naught, and then you divide that those guys in ratio T1 minus T, you end up in this kind of annulus. And so if you believe the claim, then, um, then what do you get out of that? you get that um, a lower bound for this. So the volume of, sorry, so the, yeah, V uh, evaluated this point is at least the measure of AT 
And the Brun-Minkowski inequality tells me something about the measure of AT. So, so by Brun-Minkowski, the measure of AT, uh, wait, um, yes, so we better take an nth root here. And then Brun-Minkowski, so this is for finite n. All this only holds for finite n. Um, Brun Minkowski tells me that this will be bigger than some, this is related to the measure of A naught to the one over N and the measure of A one to the one over N. And the coefficients that relate them are a Sigma K over N. Um, and then it's, this is probably exponent one minus T, which is one minus R over R. It's not an exponent, it's an argument. And then what goes, the argument of the Sigma is either the maximum or the minimum distance. So it's, it's either, um, it's either the max, the minimum or the maximum distance of points in A naught to points in A1. Um, depending on whether, depending on the sign of K. And so I, um, in my notes, I said that if K is positive, then it's capital R minus, delta r plus epsilon, and if k is negative, then it's plus. And so you can, um, if we go back, uh, so if you're, the upper bound is like r plus delta r plus epsilon, the lower bound is capital R minus epsilon, but doesn't hurt if I subtract, I, I get an even lower bound if I subtract a little R delta as well. Um, so I get an expression like this. Let's raise it to the, oh yes. And so this is, so now A naught here, this is the ball of radius epsilon around X naught. And we know that as epsilon goes to zero, the measure of that ball shrinks to zero. So let's let epsilon go to zero. And now I get the volume of the annual uh, the sphere of radius R times one plus delta minus the volume of the sphere of radius R. I'm gonna raise the whole exponent. I'm gonna raise the thing to the nth power is bigger than this term is going to zero by what we did last class. And this term is does, is con, going to a con, some non-zero constant, so it doesn't hurt. And I'm left over. What's left over is the other term, um, sigma k over n r over r of r minus or plus r times one minus or plus delta after epsilon's gone to zero, and um, this, this is the volume of the annulus. A1 is this annulus around X naught minus the ball of radius R around X naught. So this is basically V of capital R, one plus delta minus V of capital R. And uh, right, so I wanted to prove, I wanted to prove point A, which involved the areas. And so, I would to get the the upper area, the upper Minkowski capacity of the sphere of radius little r. I'd like to divide this by r delta, and then take the limit as delta goes to zero. Now um, that that's like dividing the other side by r delta little r delta. But of course, to to, to get a derivative over here, I would rather um, div be by dividing my capital R. So let me. Um, let me write the little r out here and multiply by capital R and replace this by a capital R. And now the limit delta goes to zero. 
tells me that the a of little r is bigger than r over r um, sigma k over n r over r uh, at r sigma is continuous. Um, a of capital R. And so, if I, and if I remember now, if I remember what sigma was, um, so sigma of t k over n um, theta, let's say, is basically s k over n t theta over s k over n theta, where um, if k is positive, s k over n theta is basically sine of theta root k over n. And if k is negative, sorry, this and s k over n theta is hyperbolic sine. And if k is zero, then s k over n theta is just theta. Um, and so now there's some remark to make. There's the, the remark. So let me draw a picture of these. Let's let's try to remember what these functions look like. So if I normalize k to be oh yes, and if I normalize k to be one, uh, sine looks like this. So that's sine theta, and theta looks like this, and hyperbolic sine looks like this. They all have the same slope at the origin. But so you can see that um, if I take some quantity a of a of theta, and I divide it by this, it's much less likely to be decreasing than if I divide it by this. And similarly, if I divide it by this, it's uh, less likely to be decreasing than I than if I divide it by this. So there's somehow a spectrum of these things that I can put in the denominator. And for different k, for a larger k, it would look like this. And for a smaller curvature, it would look like that. And for a small negative curvature, it would look like this. And for a large negative curvature, it would look like that. There's this, this range of things I can put in the denominator. And the question is sort of like, what is the slowest increasing or possibly fastest decreasing function I could put in the denominator and still have a non-increasing function. So a denominator of theta want this non-increasing. And that's much easier to have if I put one of these larger things than if I put one of these smaller things. Um, so, uh, so, so I had, so this thing is a ratio and it's a ratio of things like this. And so if I unpack the ratio, what I get in the end is, um, oh yes. And since T is little r over capital R, that exactly converts the argument of the thing in the numerator. The thing in the denominator has argument capital R. The thing in the numerator has argument little r. And so what I get in the end is, R a r over s k over n of r uh, oh yes I rate when I raised this guy to the nth power I should have picked up an n here So it's bigger than capital R, A, R divided by S, K over N, capital R to the N. And that was basically the theorem, except I wasn't careful. I guess I stated the theorem for positive Ks. Where's my theorem? Yeah, I, I wrote this theorem as though K was positive. And what we've just discovered is that it also works when K is negative, provided you so I should put absolute values on K. 
but then I need hyperbolic sine in the denominator if k is negative, and I just need uh, you know the r to the n minus one if k is zero, and I should have put absolute values on k here, and there's um, there's uh, sorry I guess it was here that I should really have the absolute values on k, and then it's cinch if k is negative. And I should have an absolute value here. No, I should just wait, wait, I've messed things up a little bit. I have messed things up a little bit in that I've got, I flipped the, the order of the numerator and the denominator here. So this should be n. And it's not over absolute value of k, it's at over positive part of k. And, and that sh should have been the same in both these statements. And so let me explain where the interval comes from now. So if k is zero or negative, then the positive, where, so k plus here is the max of k and zero, then the thing in the norm, then, then this holds true for all r. It's only when k is positive that I'm in some limited range of r. And um, where did that come from? If I go, well, so it comes from the fact that when K is positive, sine vanishes at some point. Sine of theta vanishes at pi. And similarly, S K over N of theta equals zero at theta equals uh, pi over root k over n. And so on the other hand, if I look, if I look in the middle of my proof at, I guess, about uh, maybe this point here, this sigma here to the nth power is a ratio of two things. And the one in the denominator is going to hit zero before the one in the numerator because the one in the numerator is multiplied by a parameter less than one. And so when, uh, when capital R hits this bound, the, the denominator of this is going to blow up. And the only, but on the other hand, this thing has an upper bound. And when R is small, this is finite because we assumed we assumed local finiteness of the measure. We assumed that this measure space was locally finite and sigma finite. And so this, this side when R is small has to be less than infinity. And that means the other side has to is bounded. And if the denominator in sigma is going to zero, the only thing that can compensate it to keep this bounded is the difference between R at these larger things has to be zero. And so that basically says that the difference between R at when V capital R hits this critical value um, for all larger R's, this has to be equal to that. So, so notice V of R plus delta has to equal V of, let's say, R star. And this, where this here is R star. And so that's why we only look on, so this is K plus. That is why we only consider R's in this limited interval. So this is R star. And our star, sorry, our star is infinite. When k is when k is negative or zero, our star is infinite. But when k is positive, our star is finite. So I guess I should call, you know, I don't know. And so that actually leads to, uh, sorry, how do I get rid of this? Uh, let's go back to drawing mode. Yeah. Um, so. So we have a corollary to the proof setting our star equals pi 
root n over k plus. Um, the whole, the diameter of support m can't be larger than 2r star. Maybe it's even maybe it's even the rate. Uh, yeah. So somehow when I blow, I if I keep blowing the thing up at some finite radius. If r if k is positive at some finite radius, um, I'm going to have all the mass because I, the volume can't keep increasing beyond beyond this critical radius. And this is sort of a non-sharp uh, Bonnet Myers diameter bound. For k positive and n less than infinity. So if you're one of these CD can spaces, k is positive, n is less than infinity, you can't, your the diameter of the support of your measure can't be too big. Are there questions? And I think we managed to, we, uh, we managed to complete the proof of the theorem uh, uh, at this, basically this point here, this is the theorem. That's, that's step A of the theorem and step B we completed like yesterday. Okay. And so the, the, of course, what's really true, the sharp version would be that the diameter of um, support of M should really be less than pi root N minus one over K and equality holds on the round sphere. The, uh, And with the appropriate radius, which I guess is one over square root of k over n minus one. I don't know. Uh, maybe the no, maybe it's just square root of k. You can figure out what the equality case is yourself. All right, so that's one cool thing to come out of this argument of uh, this bishop gromov theorem is that if k is positive and n is finite, the diameter of the space can't be too large. At least this, from our point of view, where the measure vanishes, we are not interested in any way. So we're only ever interested. We're, we could almost set m to be support m without loss of generality. The only time that that's not a useful perspective is when you're taking limits of spaces, and it could be that the you know, the measure outside outside is vanishing. And so but the limiting space might have stuff where the measure is vanished. And but um, most if we're considering a fixed space, then we might as well take the the space to be the support of the measure. So what else other all other consequences? Right, so um, so another corollary to Bishop Myers, and this is Villani uh, theorem 30.13 is a bound on Hausdorff dimension. So, let me recall how you go about defining the Hausdorff dimension. Um, so recall, if you just have a metric space um, and you're given a real parameter, I don't know, D bigger than zero, um, 
you define this kind of outer measure HD at psi and, and delta positive. Um, you define HD of M by looking at covers. You try to take a minimum over all covers M in countable union of subsets SI, where the diameter of the SI is less than our delta. And um, then you add up the diameters of the SIs to the power D. And I think that's about it. And then you, you so you observe that um, that H that uh, this is the bigger I make delta, the more covers I have to look at, and so the smaller this infimum will be. And so this is this quantity is monotone in delta, and you define H D to be the limit as delta goes to zero. And this is a Borel measure. This guy is a Borel measure. And, um, and the other thing is that um, how, if I look at this, th this thing as a function of capital D now, um, if I've chosen D too large, I'm going to get zero. And if I've chosen D too small, I'm going to get plus infinity. And so there's some sharp threshold D star. Um, so HD is non increasing in D, and it's non increasing in a very dramatic way. It, um, in fact, jumps from plus infinity to zero at some D star. And we call D star the Hausdorff dimension. The Hausdorff dimension of M. So that's that's a quick recall of what, and you know, you think about how this works. So like if you have, for example, a, a little bit of surface area in the sitting in three space and you cover it with small sets, let's say small balls, the number of balls of radius epsilon that you need to cover it is going to be something like r squared times the, or the, the area divided by r squared, I guess, right? The big, smaller r is the more sets I need to cover it. And so if I raise this So if I take this number, so let's, if I take the number of balls of radius R and I multiply it by 2R to the D, um, if D is bigger than two, then as, and, and of course, two R is gonna have to be less than Delta. Then if D is bigger than two, then as, delta go as r goes to zero, this thing is going to beat this thing and it will converge to zero. If d is less than two, then there'll be more uh, r's in the denominator than there are in the numerator. And as r goes to zero, this will blow up. Only when d is equal to two can this thing have a chance to converge to a finite number. And that, that's telling us that this surface area is two dimensional. Um, so my claim is that this, a corollary of the bishop gromov theorem is that we get a bound on the Hausdorff dimension. I think it's probably the bound is N, but let's see what it actually works out to. Um, so what's, this, what's the sharp statement of the corollary is that um, if, or the exact statement, the M, if my measure space has entropic curvature dimension parameters, K and N, then um, the Hausdorff dimension of M is at most N.
I guess, sorry. Um, I should have said NM is the support of the measure. Otherwise, I would just replace the M here by the support of the measure. And let me uh, sketch the proof. Um, so basically, if I have a nested sequence of balls in my space, um, any point in this ball, if I take a ball of radius 2r around it, it will envelop this ball. And so this is contained in, oh, sorry, wait, um, is going to be contained in x, not 2r. And so the inequality we just showed, the Bishop part B of the Bishop Gromov inequality tells me that the measure of the ball of radius x over integral up to r of st k over n to the nth power dt over t dominates um, whatever I have if I replace this by. 2R, 2 capital R. Sorry, that's not D, DT over T. And of course, that's bigger than this. This larger ball contains the ball around Z of radius R. Somehow I can't help writing that D in the denominator. It's a bad habit from calculus. And we also know that um, the S K over N of T is to leading order T and the corrections are order T squared. And this is, you know, this is some known function of K and N. So that means that um, so I can rewrite this inequality in the form um, this measure over something that I basically know. Um, I'm not so there's there's constants, but I don't care about the constants. Um, it's basically something like r to the n over n times one plus o r squared, where again, this just depends on k and n, is bigger than, let me just call this constant on the right-hand side is just some constant. It maybe depends on z, but it doesn't depend on x naught. And it certainly depends on r, and it probably depends on k and n. And so we have sort of a uniform lower bound on the measures of balls. So I can absorb these constants into the C. This is capital O K of N of R squared. And so now if I take a maximal collection, so So um, recall, oh yes, by the um, by Bishop Romov again, and local finiteness of of M. We know that um. that every ball has finite volume because the Bishop Romov inequality says the volume can't grow too fast. And so any disjoint 
a collection of balls. Of, let's say where all of these guys live in a given set. So take some big ball, put as many balls of disjoint balls of radius little r inside it as you can. And since, since the measure of none of these balls is too small, um, they all have the same radius. Uh, there can't, and the measure of this is finite and they're disjoint. They can't, there can't be too many of them. So that, in other words, the mass, the, the measure of the big ball has to dominate the sum of the measures of the little balls. And that's at least the number of little balls. Let me, call, let me put this capital Y or whatever. Capital J, I don't know. Um, that's at least J times C tilde times R to the N plus something that goes to zero as R goes, to, sorry, something that goes to zero as R squared goes to zero. Um, we see that um, we get a bound for J, the number of disjoint balls. Great. And um, so choose a maximal disjoint collection of R balls. In B Z R. They're at most J of them. And because of maximality, it implies that if I double them, I must cover the whole set. Right, if I, if I could double all these little balls and I still had some space left over, some point outside it, then I would take a ball of radius R centered at that point, and that would be a, an additional disjoint element to put into this collection, and that can't happen by maximality. And so therefore, <clears throat> therefore the, um, if I take D bigger than N, let's say, and I look at the Hausdorff dimension, delta dimensional outer measure of BZR, it's an infimum of coverings, but I can cover it by these balls that I've been talking by these balls here. Um, that's gotta be at most um, the sum up to J of the diameter of these guys is no bigger than two R. So it's like two R to the D and that's less than, um, that's less than M B Z capital R over C tilde um, R to the N times some lower order term. And so in, in the numerator, I have something like two to the D times R to the D. And if, if D is bigger than N, then this is gonna be forced to go to zero as R goes to zero. So whatever sets I've covered by, if they have diameter less than two R, then they can be fit inside a ball of radius two R. So, um, so uh, somehow this shows that for D bigger than N, the Hausdorff outer measure. So that implies now taking the limit Delta goes to zero HD of B Z R is zero for every D bigger than N, which implies that the Hausdorff measure of BZR is at most N.
right? This sharp transition that we talked about here. Uh, all so you can't have n over here because then um, then you would have uh, so n has to be the left of the place where it goes to zero. Sorry, the Hausdorff dimension, the Hausdorff dimension little n has to be left of the place it goes to zero. And we know that for every capital N plus epsilon, it's still going to zero. So that's one theorem. And there's one more theorem that I would love to prove, but I'm out of time. But let me just state the theorem because somehow the flavor, oh yeah, there's two more theorems. So two more consequences that we'll talk about next class. Two more consequences. of n less than infinity are um, MDM in CD epsilon KN implies uh, it's locally doubling. In other words, if you're in some bounded set, um, then you, you compare the volume, the, the measure of a ball of radius F R to the measure of a ball of radius 2 R. It, it never it ne never goes up. When you double the radius, it never the volume never goes up by more than a bound constant. When you half the radius, the volume never goes down by more than a bound constant. And, and the, the flavor of this is very similar to the flavor of that proof of the Hausdorff dimension bound that we just gave. And another property is that um, this implies that the space has the heine borel property. i.e. every uh, closed bounded subset is compact, which is a nice property to have, sometimes called proper. Spaces that have this kind of barrel property are sometimes called proper spaces, i.e. Um, is proper. And the proof of both of these, the local doubling property and the heine borel property are both going to follow from this kind of argument where we say, if you try to take, you fix a ball of bounded radius, you can't have two, and look at sub balls of that of some fixed radius, there can't be too many in there. And if you take a maximal collection of them and you double them, then you get a cover. And that's, that's going to be the, the engine that drives the proof of both of these properties. Any questions? So this already, so we started out assuming that the measure was locally finite and sigma finite, and this uh, reach, this sort of non-smooth reach curvature bounded below by K dimension bounded above by fin some finite capital N. And we get out of this, that this every closed bounded subset is compact. So it's not that different from Euclidean space or from a finite dimensional space, let's say. All right, so I'm going to pause the recording and we can.